You are listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast, where we believe the Bible is sufficient and answers life's problems. I'm your host, Pastor Jeff Christensen. This podcast is for everyone in the body of Christ, staff pastor, church leader, caring homemaker, the responsible businessman, everybody. But it's also for my Calvary Chapel University students. Shout out. Hello to you guys. All of us are called to offer counsel regularly. And we every day need a word of counsel from the Lord. So these episodes are designed to assist you in learning to give godly counsel. Also to develop discernment in evaluating counsel that you receive. So it's my prayer that these podcasts, that these episodes will enlarge your vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a wonderful counselor. God bless you. Grab your Bibles. Let's get started. See you on the inside. Welcome back to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. I'm in studio with my special guest, Dr. Bill Hines, and we are going to be talking about his book, his publication called Leaving Yesterday Behind. And you can find this on Kindle. Just search Amazon.com. It's paperback and Kindle, Amazon.com. And look up William Hines and Leaving Yesterday Behind. So welcome, uh, Dr. Hines. Tell us a little bit. Why did you write this book? And and then I have a couple more questions as we go, but go ahead, take it away. Why did you write Leaving Yesterday Behind? What does that title mean, and why did you write it? Well, I wrote it uh, several years ago, actually 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. I was a youth minister, and there were a couple of questions that kept coming up with the people in our ministry one was had to do with are we destined to repeat the sins of our fathers if my father was a bad guy does that mean that i'm gonna have to be a bad guy too you know there are things that people will say such as if somebody is abused as a child they will grow up to be an abuser now that is certainly not the case sometimes it is but that's certainly not the case but it's a fear that people have Another thing was, as I was sitting around with young men, uh, like in a camp situation, I heard them one night say, as they went around just talking about their lives, somebody said, I'm just afraid I've got to turn out to be like my dad. And they all picked up on that. And that just got me thinking. It got me thinking about Exodus 20 and the sins of the fathers are visited on the third and fourth generations. What we usually miss there is it goes on to say, but the righteousness of the fathers or of the parents to a thousand generations. God is much more into blessing than he is into cursing. But there are reasons that things carry over. Um, And so I wanted to be sure that I was a good father and that I passed on the very best to my kids. But I also wanted people to know that they did not have to turn out to be like their parents, and if anybody did anything wrong to them, they were not destined to live as a victim. The subtitle is A Victim No More. We have to make a decision. If somebody attacks me and hurts me, brutalizes me, and it really bothers me, the question I have to live with is, do I let that define me? Are they going to decide who I am for the rest of my life or does God have something to say about it? Yeah, and in chapter one, you say, you ask the question, what is my problem and and who is to blame? And then you begin with Gene's story. Take us into the book a little bit in chapter one, and, and who is to blame? Well, it's a great question. We live in a, uh, a <laughs> blaming society, very litigious. Uh, if something goes wrong, we sue people. Sometimes it has to be done, but... Uh, We do live in a society where people, well, right now we're hearing a lot in the news, uh, people blaming everybody, calling names, uh, telling people that they're ruining their lives. And, you know, I've just got to say, even if somebody else is doing something awful, even if it's a politician or some celebrity that has, you know, some kind of a, a following, Does that have to define who I am? Mm -hmm. Does that have to ruin me? Well, what I find is, as I look into Scripture, is 
guess what? I was going to sin anyway. No matter what my parents did, no matter what anybody did to me, I was born a sinner. And that's in the scripture. King David talked about that in, in the womb, he was conceived in sin. We know from the writings of Paul that we come into this world as sinners and that we all miss the mark. So my problem is that I live in a fallen world, mm -hmm. that I have the desire to sin within me, and sin is is trying to get me from the outside as well. It's a fallen world. It's not a perfect world. But who is to blame? I am. Mm. I'm not to blame for what somebody else does to me, but I am to blame for how I respond. Yeah, how you respond. And you're moving right through. Tell me a little bit more about the story of Jean as chapter 2 even continues with that in The Promise of Life, and you even say there how a person can cover up. What are your thoughts on that as you go into chapter 2? Well, isn't it interesting as we look back at the garden, and this book in several places goes back to the garden, and how Adam and Eve sinned, and they tried to cover up, not mm -hmm. just with the fig leaves covering their private parts, as we might refer to it, but they hid in the bushes. They tried to hide from God which tells me they just didn't know him as well as perhaps we would think they, they would if they thought that they could hide from him. But he found them out, of course. We all have things that we try to cover up with. Some try to cover up with alcohol. Some create other problems so they don't have to deal with the real problem. And I don't want to say that we all do that. Some of those people are fairly rare, but it can be very demonstrative what they do to create an issue just so this other issue isn't mm, looked at. Yeah. We all cover up. We cover up with complaining, with mm -hmm. whining. So-and-so did this to me at school. Mm -hmm. This girl or this boy said a mean thing to me at school, and I don't want to go back to school anymore. Maybe I've got a test tomorrow I don't want to face as well, and that just really helps. But we all cover up in many ways, and it could be through something like an addiction it could be through complaining. It could be through not complaining, doing the opposite, always having a rosy outlook on mm. everything and just being realistic so we never have to confront problems. Mm, yeah. And, you know, what I really love about the book and the chapters is that it, at the end of each chapter, you include a study guide to consider, to analyze, and to dig deeper. And, you know, as you were talking about, Adam and Eve try to cover their sin and shame with fig leaves. You ask the question, how do you attempt to cover your sin and shame? Uh, I think this is uh, very insightful and helpful uh, to any of our, our students that are interested or the, our listeners on this podcast. This book includes a study guide. Who would you recommend, before we continue uh, our survey of the book, who would you recommend this for? Uh, could a counselor, a biblical counselor, use this book as a tool to help people? Who would that counselor uh, help with this book, number one? And number two, if if you're a listener and you're facing an issue that you want to leave yesterday behind and, and, and declare, I'm a victim no more, and find, as Bill, you write, a uh, new life and how to begin to live and and to find victory over leaving yesterday behind. With all that said, who would you say this book is for? The counselor and the person uh, being counseled? Yes, the counselor and the person being counseled or anybody. Now, there's kind of a coy way of saying it. Anybody that has a past, we all <laughs> have a past. We all have habits that we form that are not helpful we all have things in our past. We all have to deal with maybe one or another parent that was not always kind. Perhaps we had a perfectionistic mother or father who just made us always feel like we're walking on eggshells because everything had to be just perfect. Well, how do we put that behind us? This book gets at those kinds of things. And you mentioned Jean. She had a, a wonderful life from the outside, but she had an ultra-controlling mother a very wealthy father that they found out later had an affair for 25 years. Her mother even knew about it, but her mother used it as leverage mm. to control the family. And so she had a lot of growing to do. And as we went through things together uh, in counseling setting, 
she really applied the stuff. She really took it to her pastor, took it to her husband. She had a wonderful husband willing to help her with all this stuff. She went from having panic attacks at work to really being able to take on life in a new way and even got over her fear of having a child and later had a family. Wow. Oh, what a great, I mean, what a that, great testimony. And that's, a good, that's a good story. It's a happy story. But again, we all have stuff we need mm-hmm. to deal with. It, it may be a temper. It may be, you know, just uh, it may have to do with, with uh, things related to food or, or, or maybe we run and jog so much that it's damaging to our body. But there's something deep inside having to do with our identity or something that drives us to do things that are actually harmful. Yeah. Well, in a favorite chapter, that leads me to chapter three, Grace for the Journey. And what a favorite chapter of biblical change and newness of life, the nature of grace, applying grace, uh, walking in his mercy, uh, doing God's work, God's way, that ever-flowing waterfall of grace. Guide us through chapter three, how grace leaves yesterday behind. What a, what a great uh, subject for the final paragraph in that chapter. And then the, the study guide, consider, analyze, digging deeper, and then making it real. You kind of really get the student or the reader to put it to practice. Well, and the study guides I find are helpful, like homework for counselees mm-hmm. or, or to do a Sunday school around. One of my daughters had her book club do it, and they did the study guides and discussed it at each book club. Um, and that, of course, made me very happy when my daughter was willing to yeah. do that. Um, you know, grace is often thought of either as grace is something where God always forgives me and he doesn't even care what I do because he's such a nice guy. Or as I often thought of it, grace applied to when I became a Christian, for it's by grace you've been saved, Mm -hmm. not of works. But I didn't think of it beyond that. But what I learned is that grace is almost like a muscle that as we walk in the mercy of God and as we walk forgiven, we become stronger walking as forgiven people. You know, applying his grace at the heart of it is God's mercy, Mm -hmm. God's forgiveness of sinners. And one of the things uh, that I write in here is I say that it's a very different thing to live as though we are forgiven right now. You know, there's a chapter on forgiveness, but one thing about forgiveness is sometimes we hang on to unforgiveness so that we have something over somebody else. Maybe we think, if I forgive that person, I'm letting them off too easy. Mm. And that's where we need to leave it in the hands of God. And there's a discussion on that later in the book. But some people just don't accept God's present mercy because of a lack of understanding. Some may reject God's mercy uh, because it's too convicting. Uh, they, they, and, and they believe that they are unforgivable that they, whatever it is that they've done, they just think, God can't forgive that. He may let me into heaven, but he won't forgive me now, and I can't live a different life because of what I've done. But finally, I, I would also add that there are those who just don't want to experience God's mercy, as weird as that sounds, because once we accept God's mercy, then something referred to as gratitude comes mm-hmm. in. If you're kind to me, I at least need to say thank you. Mm. But if you're God and you forgive me and you set me on a course of a whole new life, what does that say? Some people don't want the pressure of having to be grateful. Mm. Yeah, and that leads us to chapter four, that whole new life, that new identity, the new family that you speak of, a new relationship as God, our father, I'm his child, where there's a new identity. Why is identity important as as we're trying to go chapter by chapter? I don't know that we'll make it, but <laughs> quickly on chapter four, and we'll go to chapter five next. Well, briefly, uh, the identity issue is once we know that I have a problem, a sin problem, and we know that Jesus, the Messiah, is the promise of life and that mm. what he did on the cross, his finished work, accomplished everything I could not do for myself, 
and by trusting in that, I'm forgiven. And then he gives me grace for this grand journey. Well, I have a new identity. I'm no longer the old person because I have an, a new heart that God has placed within me. I am indeed, as Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, I am a new creation in Christ. And so with this new identity, I have a new father. If my earthly father was bad, then I don't need to worry about that. I need to forgive him. I need to deal with that. But God is my father, and he is perfect. His is the legacy that I'm called to live. Yeah, wow. And and then we, we move right along, which is kind of some of the meat of what we're talking about is learning to change in chapter 5. And where are we responsible? What do we, why do we avoid responsibility? And, and how you would term it, uh, the buck stops here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then in chapter six, learning to change. So we begin talking about the topic of changing biblically. You know, so often, and I've certainly done this, we talk about, I need to do this, or I'm trying to do this, or mm-hmm. I'm trying to overcome this. We need to be very honest with ourselves. First of all, we need to take ownership. This problem is mine to deal with, nobody else's. I need to deal with this. And once we take ownership, and there's more to it, of course, but once we take ownership, we need to take aim at what is it God wants me to change? How does God want me to put this behind me or to change so that I don't continue this habit so that's taking aim. What it is? What is it I'm going to change? And then finally, taking action. Work out a plan of action. How am I going to overcome? Because we, if we don't make a plan to overcome, and if we don't work that plan, we will not change. Yeah. So the the learning to change, chapter five, taking ownership, uh, taking uh, in chapter six, taking aim, and then taking action. In chapter 7, and then we move uh, right into chapter 8, and we talk about a, a kind of like a, a topic within the book on anger, which is a great chapter. Well, and I, really chapters 8 and 9 and, and 10 are putting into practice what you learned, hopefully, in the first part of the book. How do we deal with anger? Well, how do we take ownership and take aim and take action dealing with anger. What are the dynamics of anger? You know, some people will say, oh, you just need to hit a pillow or, you know, and yet Proverbs tells us a fool gives full vent to his anger. And sometimes the things that we may naturally do to get over it or get past it really uh, exacerbate it and make it worse. So, Uh, That chapter is on anger, but also the dynamics of forgiveness. How do I forgive? How do I truly forgive somebody and move on? Uh, There are dynamics there. Let me say this one thing about that chapter, and it is this. I asked the question in there, do I have to like the person I forgive? You know, it's not like if I'm a kid and I, you know, am asked to forgive so-and-so and I forgive him, it doesn't necessarily mean that I need to have him over for sleepovers mm. you know, uh, on, on Friday nights. Uh, some people just don't work well together. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when we forgive somebody, it takes a while to get used to it. Mm-hmm. And we, we do need to get used to it. We do need to work through it. We should always be cordial, always be kind, and desire the best for that other person. But it's unrealistic to think that by saying, I forgive you, everything's just all okay. We still got to work with our attitudes. But what we've said to God is, I'm seeking to act toward them as you've acted toward me. That's so wonderful. Great, great chapter. And then 11, you know, we were wrapping her up here with loving God with all that you are and loving your neighbor as yourself and why love is the greatest. You know, I wrote this at a time when my mother was dying. Uh, She died uh, before this was actually published, but I had written a lot of it. And that's why chapter 10 on avoiding self-pity, I wrote that for me. (laughs) Uh, But I find it uh, others relate to it as well, and it's it's from Psalm 73. And the idea is, do I I live in self-pity 
about what I don't have or whatever it is I think is wrong, or do I trust God to go on? Because if I let somebody else define me, if I let circumstances define me, and I miss out on what God has to offer, that's not God's fault. It's not the bad person's fault. It's my fault because God lays it out how we can do that. But when it came to the end of it, I remember sitting back and looking at the whole book, except for the last chapter, and I asked myself, why would anybody go to all this trouble? Mm -hmm. Why do it? Why not just say, forget you all, Hmm. I'm going to the mountains, where I am right now, actually. (laughs) Uh, But what I realized, it's as though the Lord led me, the Holy Spirit led me to the great commandment. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Why do I change? Why do I go to all the trouble? Because I love God. Mm -hmm. And I love God because of how he has loved me and all he has done for me. It's really the matter of living a life of gratitude because of all that God has done. And once we learn to begin to love God with all that we are and love others, in a similar way, life changes. Yeah, wonderful. And once again, we're listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast and interviewing Dr. Bill Hines about his book, Living, Leaving Yesterday Behind. And we've looked at several sections of the book. Section one, the problem. Section two, the promise. Section three, the process. And section four, the purpose. And great, you know, review of each of those chapters, but then you have a subtitle, A Victim No More, and you put in the epilogue, A Victim No More. Tell us why that subtitle. At the time, and unfortunately, this is still going on in our culture, people were living as victims. There were some, what I would say, are unscrupulous counselor types out there that were helping people maintain their victimhood because it kept them coming for counseling. The thing is, I I remember one celebrity introducing his therapist, and he said, this guy's been my therapist for 25 years. Well, my question was, is he any good? If he's still there after 25 years, did you not find any, any freedom, any help? And in this guy's case, as we learned later, uh, no, he didn't. The therapist kept him hanging on. Now, this isn't about bad therapists, but it is about being a victim. We don't have to maintain that victim mentality because God has set us free. Mm. If we are in Christ, now that's critical, if we are in Christ, if we have trusted in him, he sets us free. We can get on a path of renewing the mind, which means that all that we are, our heart and our our mind, our thinking— Our will, our volition can change, can become more God-oriented, can become Christ-like, and we can pursue the things in this life that God has called us to pursue. We don't have to live as a victim of the sin nature or of anybody or anything in this life. Yeah, wow. What a a great conclusion, and thank you for explaining that subtitle. You know, you can see how God uses and is using and has used this book, uh, unmistakable, very evident. It changes lives. People's lives are transformed. And so you and I are creating courses. We're online course creators. We're building online education for people to be equipped as counselors. And likely, more than, uh, more than likely, we're going to use this book as a textbook and probably have course material and videos on this. Tell us some of your vision for an online course concerning uh, leaving yesterday behind. How will that how would we turn this into video courses? They would read the textbook, they'd watch some of your video, and then we'd have these uh, exercises for the student, and they'd earn college credit. Yes, and and I look forward to that. Assuming that it is a counselor that is, or somebody that wants to be a counselor that's taking this course, I want them to apply this to them first. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I always say that to our crowds, or we we try to remember to always say it, Galatians 6, 1, that you who are spiritual, if someone's caught in a sin, restore them gently 
looking to yourself first, lest you too be tempted. And the idea is, as we apply this, because this is a book that applies to all of us. Again, as I said, we all have a, a past. We all have a sinful past. It may not be the same as another person's, but we all have that sin nature that we have battled, or I hope we've battled. This will help the counselor get on a better foundation, and then they'll have that much more to share with the counselee down the road. But there'll be exercises, there'll be uh, ways that we will share with them, ways to to use this to apply it to their own lives. Dr. Howard Eyrick used it for years in Birmingham at his school at Briarwood Theological Seminary. He's had some great ideas and great feedback for me at how his students grew through the years by using this book. That's great. Well, you've been listening once again to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. We thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Bill Hines, for being our guest. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. You can learn more at jeffchristensen.org. That's jeffchristensen.org. And be sure to share this podcast with a friend. Well, may the Lord richly bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.